à, trước khi thu cái bài cái quyển sách mà radiation medicine book á, thì à, chúng ta lưu ý là nếu và hệ điều hành của Win 32 thì nó sẽ đọc chậm Windows 7 32 á, thì nó sẽ đọc chậm vừa phải nếu chúng ta dùng cái hệ điều hành cũng Win 7 mà hệ điều hành 64 thì nó tốc độ đọc nó rất là nhanh mà chúng ta không nghe kịp cho nên tôi phải dùng cái máy của 30 uh, 32 bit để mà tôi thu nó quay video trên màn hình như vậy thì xin chào các bạn và chúng ta sẽ bật cái trình The Radiation Medicine Book để mà nghe cái robot nó đọc à, và màn hình thì chúng ta uh, lấy cái khung theo cái uh, trình trong cái Religion Medicine Book của cái phần mềm của Microsoft Reader họ đã thiết kế sẵn cho ta một cái cái khung theo cái cái, cái khung dạng của nó bung ra như vậy đó là 549 và 742 thì uh, đó chúng ta sẽ vào go to sẽ đọc là begin reading à, bấm lệnh đọc bắt đầu đọc và tới đây chúng ta bắt đầu bấm play để nghe nó đọc All rights reserved under international and pan-American copyright conventions. Published in the United States by 1873 Press. Tức là xuất bản ở tại Mỹ năm 1873. New York. of Barnes and Noble, Incorporated. Book designed by Edward Work, Elm Design www.elmdesign.com ISBN 0594040280 Introduction The modern visitor to Norwich who has bound his way through steep, winding streets or staircase valleys into the most romantic of English marketplaces is within a stone's throw of the spot in which the famous physician whose the centenary East Anglia was celebrating lately spent the greater part of his long and fortunate life. A very ordinary house, distinguished, however, with a memorial tablet, occupies the site. The garden, too, with its rarities, which Evelyn, when he visited Brown in 1671, thought of paradise, has long since disappeared. But close at hand towers the great east window of St. Peter Mancroft, the magnificent church in which the medicus religious worshipped, and old Norwich affords not a few glimpses from crowded streets into venerable courtyards with vistas of greenery beyond, which make it easy to imagine the circumstances of his abode. Although Norwich took the lead in commemorating his birth, he was not, as is often imagined, born there. His father also a Thomas, came of a stock of Cheshire squires. He was a younger son, and had gone up to London to push his fortune in trade. At the beginning of the century, we find him settled in or near Cheapside as a mercer. Here, on October 19, 1605, the author of the religion, O Medici, was born. Of his early years, almost nothing is known beyond the fact that he passed his school days at Winchester, and thence, in 1623, entered as a fellow commoner at Pembroke, then known as Broadgates Hall, Oxford to College, in which, a hundred years later, his great 18th century deputy, Samuel Johnson, past 14 months of proudly concealed poverty. 
brown means appear to have been at this as at all other times. Sample, and he was able to gratify, as Johnson never could, the varied thirst of an ingle apt yet more encyclopedic than his, and far more adventurous in the temper of its curiosity. At odds, for indeed, in both as in Johnson's and in Shelley's days of mind, of this type found less than no help from the studies of the place. The great naturalists of the Restoration period were infants or unborn. Even the universally curious Dr. Wilkins and his like-minded friend, John Evelyn, the diarist, were boys at school and Francis Bacon had only just sounded in the Novum Organum the summons to the methodic interpretation of nature. Brown, whose sympathetic imagination assimilated him so much, never comprehended Bacon, but he was not untouched by the Baconian and ardor of discovery and it was scientific enthusiasm more than professional ambition which sent the young Oxford graduates abroad in 1630 to pursue the study of medicine and natural history in the three foreign universities, Montpellier, Padua, and Leiden, which were then the focuses of advanced research. The greater part of the following three years was thus spent of the details of his life in France, Italy, and Flanders. We have little knowledge, but the religio permits us one or two significant glimpses. We see the English Protestant student of medicine as he paces the streets of Montpellier or Padua with a crowd of companions even now. In the very heyday of dogmatic youth, listening with lifted heart to the Ave Mary bell, and moved even to the point of weeping abundantly, as some solemn procession passes by, while my consorts, blind with opposition and prejudice, have fallen into an excess of scorn and laughter or we find him arguing with an Italian physician who could not believe perfectly the immortality of the soul because Palin seemed to make a doubt thereof. These glimpses indicate in the zealous student who took his doctor's degree at Leiden the temperament of decided originality. They also make it easy to understand the mood in which a year or two after his return to England, Brown composed, as a sort of private confession, for his own behoof, the religious so met achieved. According to the most authentic tradition, it was written at Shipping Hall, Halifax, an old house and park, since somewhat rudely encroached upon by industry. Its date is fixed with some precision in the year 1635 by one of the spacious tellers of Militude sits author loves. As yet, he remarks incidentally, I have not seen one revolution of Saturn, nor hath my pulse beat thirty years a double mode of reckoning in which we seem to catch the far off murmur of generations of me, the angle doctors, prescribing for the unhappy patient with their eyes on the midnight horizon, and helping him at the bidding of the stars. But the me, the angle cord vibrates incessantly in brown, by whatever richer and redder notes it be accompanied and outsung. The religious O Medici was not designed for publication, and it had been breathed with delight in this by a steadily enlarging circle of friends for several years before the indiscretion of one of them gave the eager printer his chance. 
of Pirate. His edition the year of in December 1642, followed early in 1643 by the appearance of the authentic text, which Brown, in alarm, had hastened to supply, characteristically enough, to no other than the erring but scarcely penitent pirate himself. The book's fame spread with a rapidity then almost unexampled. Sir Kendall Digby's account of how he sent his man out to buy a copy, received it at bedtime, read it in rapt excitement through the night watches, and rose early to write his hundred and more pages of observations, takes us across two centuries to the days when people fought or old mortality and the heart of Midlow. Thien, the Latin translation, made in Holland, gave the religion owed the franchise of the continent. The harsher dogmatisms of the age did not fail to resent Brown's sweet reasonableness to heretics and papists, and the formidable Alexander Ross in the Medicus Medicatus drove his heavy bludgeon this way, and that through the tenuous fabric of the religion owed without damaging the wit its spiritual substance. For it was as the air invulnerable, and these vain blows, malicious mockery. When the religion owed was thus at length tartly sent forth, Brown had been for some years established as a physician at Norwich with a thriving practice and considerable private means. He had also married in 1641, and the mild scorn expressed in the religio for that trivial and vulgar way of union does not appear to have prevented Thomas and Dorothy Brown from enjoying an exceedingly happy married life. Brown's view of woman and her place was Indeed, as uncompromisingly masculine as Milton's, is more quaintly and pleasantly expressed for him. Two, man was the whole world, and the breath of God, woman the writ and crooked piece of man. He wrote this while still the bachelor, but even after for years of marriage we find him in the vulgar errors, speculating curiously on God's purpose in creating it as a health meet to Adam. It can only have been, he opines, in view of their function as the future parents of mankind, for as or any other help, it had been better to have made another man. It is clear that Brown who showed in his speculative enterprises so much of the temper of romance was not dangerously romantic in private life. He loved to feed his imagination on mysteries and root ecstatically in the platonic page of the religio I I six over the mystery of friendship, two bodies and one soul but one suspects that love and friendship alike were in him only specialized varieties of that diffused kindliness which he extended to all forms of sentient life except the devil and the multitude, embracing in his sympathy the Spaniard and the Jew, and owning the benign fellowship with the viper and the toad, such a temperament promised a life not very rich in the comet of conflict which for many men makes three-fourths of the dangerous, but one securely and serenely harmonious. And such was, in fact, the subsequent life of Brown, cast though it was in a stormy time. The civil troubles did not disturb his tranquil labors amid the drums and tramplings of conquest. To apply his own famous phrase, he had his quiet rest 
for the Parliament was from the first securely established in Norfolk and Brown, though a uh, convinced royalist was the most practicable of partisans. Hardly an allusion to politics crosses his page. During the first fury of the struggle he offered the world, in the Religio Oath, his serene exposition of a religious faith utterly remote in temper, if not in substance, from any of the contending creeks. When the royal cause was tottering towards its final fall, he came forward again to make known the results of his inquiries into the reality of the phoenix and the griffin, whether swans sing before they die, and whether the right and the left legs of badgers are equally long. When the death of Cobble at length opened a prospect of the joyful restoration, Brown, silent through the whole Commonwealth period, found his voice again in a meditation upon the similar urns and the elegant coordination of vegetables, as majestically irrelevant as paradise lost itself to the passions and policies of the hour for twenty four years after the publication of the Hydriophile and the Garden of Cyrus Brown lived on famous, wealthy, indisputably the first man in Norwich, bringing up a large family of sons who distinguished themselves and daughters to merit wealth. He died on his 77th birthday, October 19, 1682. To the last, he occasionally wrote, but it was not until 1690 that the world read his letter to a friend, and not until the lapse of a generation that his Christian morals was at length in 1716 made known. Men whose lives pass in such complete and unbroken harmony are not often so detached and lonely in their thought. There is no work of Brown's which can be said to reflect or to stand in any direct relation with any dominant body of opinion, any prevailing method of speculation, or any defined literary tradition. Even his enthusiastic Anglicanism was, like Hobbes' theory of absolute monarchy, too deeply dyed in the curious idiosyncrasy of the thinker's brain to be congenial to plain mind and appearance. In the very title of his first book, The Religion of a Physician, there late for contemporary ears, a certain element of paradox for the profession was commonly reputed to have no religion. A course of medical study, he himself hint, furnished the presumption of atheism. In this fight of which, he asked, I dare without usurpation assume the honorable style of a Christian, or in the rest, as Bloodram says, is on the dangerous edge of things. The honest thief, the tender murderer, the superstitious atheist, and the 17th century would have added the devout physician. Brown affords this piquant interest in rich measure to great intellectual traditions which had for the most part run countermet in his mind in a curious unexpected harmony, a harmony obtained without apparent commotion or forced diversion of either from its course, as if the contending streams which in other ingle ex jostled each other aside or settled there. Differences by compromise and subterfuge had in his been transmuted into a seven warp and width of differently colored threads whose crossing only evolved the brilliant pattern. Brown does, no doubt, 
recognize distinct provinces and procedures for his religion and his philosophy, but it is misleading to class him with the watertight compartment theorists. More common in the Catholic Church than in Protestantism, who allow their reason to have no dealings with their faith, nor their faith with their reason. The watertight compartments with him have many valves and sluices, and the sustaining water flows readily to and through what was most vital both in his religion and in his speculation sprang from the same root and imaginative sympathy with every form of existence, allured by the remote, arrested by the singular, fascinated by the marvelous. I am of a constitution so general, he tells us in one of the famous opening sentences of the second part of the Religi Oath, that it consorts and sympathizes with all things I was born in the eighth climate, but seem for to be framed and constellated unto all all places. All cares may come to me one country. I am in England everywhere and under any meridian. This is not the temperament of a keen critic, and Brown's evil app was always rather the servant and minister of his temperamental needs and impulses than their controller and curb. A useful and efficient servant, inexhaustible in the quest of curious learning, posting over land and ocean without risk at the bidding of that lordly and eager imagination, and always ready when its superior needed exhilarating exercise to take the foils and be discreetly overcome. Tis my solitary recreation, cried Brown, in a sort of epicurean rapture, to pose my apprehension with those involved in IG and maze and rebels of the Trinity. I can answer all the objections of Satan and my rebellious reason with that odd resolution I learned of Tertullian. Certain the esti, qui impossible established. It might be said of Brown that he thought with his imagination, so potent are its intuitions in determining the texture of his faith. A suggestive similitude will at any time more than half capture his ascent. The allegorical description of God as a circle whose center is everywhere and its circumference nowhere pleases me beyond all the metaphysical definitions of divine and no visionary speculation of mystic or Platonist appealed in vain to Sir Thomas Brown. Man was the microcosm of the universe the visible world, the picture of the invisible, and in the vulgar and tavern music, which makes one man merry, another mad, he discovered, with odd rapture, the dire oblithical and shadowed lesson of the whole world, such a melody to the ear as the whole world, well understood, would afford the understanding, in brief, a sensible fit of that harmony which intellectually sounds in the ears of God. To say that Brown thought with his imagination is only to say that his supreme merit belongs to literature, not to philosophy. Still less did it belong to science. If the author of the religious so Medici stood aloof from his age, the laborious inquiry in the vulgar errors stood far behind it. The lofty assumption in the preface of Bacon and phrases about the need of first-hand experience and the fallacies of tradition and authority is in piquant contrast with the meanderings of Brown inquiring intellect. Just one step more emancipated than the vulgar whose erroneous beliefs about phoenixes and griffins 
After anxiously waiting all the possibilities, he decides, as it were by the turning of a hair, to be wrong. It is the old story of Apollo leaving his partnership haunts to stray across the severe threshold of academe, insufficiently equipped with the geometry requisite there. And the sages of the English academe did not hesitate to make the respected intruder understand that he was out of place. In an interesting section of his admirable life of Brown, just published, Mr. Gross has plausibly surmised that his absence from a roll of members of the Royal Society was due to a deliberate determination of the committee to exclude him. The line between literature and science was then indecisively drawn, and Brown's letters to the secretary make it tolerably evident that he would have liked to join the body few of whom could rival the natural history collection of his Norwich home, while still fewer probably to claim, as he could, to have their respective or words for sciences saved by experimental meals upon spiders and bees. A distinguished son of his own was, moreover, a member, but it may be that the real rock of offense was just that which had become the cornerstone of his fame, his style. It is well known how peremptorily the newly founded Royal Society set its face against the old sumptuous and elaborate prose with its amplification digressions, and swellings of style, and did its best to recover the primitive purity and shortness when men delivered so many things almost in an equal number of words. It accordingly exacted from all its members a close, naked, natural way of speaking, positive expressions bringing all things as near the mathematical plainness as they can. So writes Sprite, the historian of the society, and one of its earliest fellows. It is hard to believe that Brown's splendor of apparel was not expressly glanced at by this advocate of nakedness. But we are not further concerned with his criticism. For Brown's ends and aims, his writing is incomparable. It is not a cumbrous and artificial way of conveying facts any more than a symphony is a vague and equivocal way of telling the story. Like music, it creates and suggests more than it articulately expresses. If there is any English prose which it is not wholly profane to compare with the symphony of Beethoven, it is surely the magnificent discourse of the high Greek OLA file, with its vast undulations of rhythmic sound, its triumphal processions, its funereal pageants, its abysmal plunges into unfathomable depths, its ecstatic soaring to the heights of heaven. C. H. Herford. Editors note that the foregoing introduction is based upon an essay written for Brownster Centenary and published in the Manchester Guardian, and some passages of it are here reproduced by kind permission of the editor and publishers of that journal. The no. <cười> thì như vậy là chúng ta vừa nghe xong á cái uh, lời giới thiệu bây giờ nó qua tới một cái phần khác rồi đây là cái lời ghi chú của cái uh, tác giả uh, the foregreen introduction e better some upon an essay written by brown brown jerson jersonary uh, and published in the merchant to the guardian and some of best of it are here reproduced by color for submission at the editor and publisher of national 
cái nghĩa của nó tức là à, cái này cái là cái lời ghi chú à, chúng ta nhìn lại như vậy thì chúng ta đã ghi được là 29 phút rồi coi như là 30 30 phút chúng ta dừng lại xin tạm biệt um, thank you cảm ơn đã uh, listening listen listening uh, this book đã lắng nghe cái sách này